Great timing. I could really, really use some help right now. We're going to take you through the deep spring clean morning routine of a falconer today. Now this is going to cover all of the stuff that we do once it's warm enough for us to do our first good clean after winter time. We're going to talk about the reasons why we take the steps we do. So we're going to cover cleaning perches, bath pans, mews, do a little bit of manning and weighing. Okay, so we're going to cover all of that because that's part of the deep spring clean morning routine. Now ideally, you want to be cleaning your perches at least once a week, guys, at least once a week. Uh, preferably more often as you have time and, uh, and help to do so. When we're cleaning the perches, we want to clean every surface, even the ones underneath, the parts of the perch that are touching the ground, everything. That's because, especially this time of year, there's all kinds of microbial life forms, including the stuff that's come from their wastes and residual bits of food and blood that have come out of the quail or whatever they're having for lunch, drained into the wood in this particular case, or buries itself in the longleaf astroturf mats of the block perches. We want to make sure we've taken all of that away. Now, you've been hearing a lot about washing your hands because we're all dealing with the same situation right now. We're all looking out for each other and helping each other. Now, the same principle applies to cleaning the surfaces that our set feathered ones stand on, the bath pans that they bathe in, all the rest of it. We can leave residual soap residue on any perching surface, especially with something like Greenworks, which is non-toxic and environmentally friendly, but it does the job of taking down the micro microbial life forms. The bath pans, we clean them out, we let them sit with that residue on for a little while, and then we rinse the inside out. Now, what's happening when we're doing that? Let's use COVID as the example. So, when we're washing our hands with soap and water and thinking, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I, you know, you know the song, I don't have to sing it to you. Well, hopefully you do. Anyway, the reason why it works is because COVID is just a virus. It's not hunting us. It's not waiting to, to take us out. It's just sitting there on a surface, inertly being there. So we've got our little COVID bug. It's like a little ball with spikes all over it, right? A soap molecule, just imagine like a balloon with a spike sticking out of it, right? And when we surround the virus with little molecules of soap, these spikes come in and they pierce the COVID all over and they break it into pieces and render it completely harmless and useless. That's why it's perfectly okay for it to be rinsed down into your sewage treatment plant or your septic field or what have you, because it's been broken up into harmless little pieces, right? So the same thing applies to when we're dealing with microbial life forms that are on the perching surfaces in the bath pans, in the mews and elsewhere. We're breaking that material up and rendering it harmless to our feathered ones and even to ourselves, right? So, cracking on, we're going to scrub down all the surfaces on our perches. Be generous with your soapy water. And if your guys are anything like mine, <laughs> gonna get a visitor here. If your guys are anything like mine, they'll perch down below on their perches. When Sabre was alive, if he had, if he was on one of the bow perches, he used to like to slide on the sides of the bow perches. So eventually, at some point or another, they're going to come into contact with virtually every surface on the perches. Maybe not underneath, hopefully. And think in three dimensions, guys, because blood and poop and everything else is going to run all over the place. If you've got bits of grass like Mojave's got on his here, make sure you take the time and pull that out of there. 
That's why we're not allowing grass or any other plant life to proliferate in our muse because we don't want those biological materials breaking down and inviting other smaller life forms to come and join the party. Okay, so this is pretty much done. I'm pretty happy with this. And again, one of the things that happens here, once we replace this bow and turn it into more of a parabola, we're also going to rewrap it with brand new longleaf astroturf because you can see now where it's starting to wear in the middle from being stood on for so long. So it's time to replace it. All right. So, block perches. We love these block perches. These are coming to us from Westwheel Falconry. Hi, Brian and Bonnie. We love you guys very much. Now, inside the block perch, you'll see there's a locking nut, and these are really great. Uh, this keeps the top of the block perch from coming free randomly. I've had this happen with other models of block perches. The other thing about these is that they're nice and flexible. The only downside, I guess, if there is one, is that you have to really make sure you grab the block perch in the middle as you're lifting it up out of the ground because you don't want this bending. All right, but great block perches. So I've taken the longleaf astroturf mat. I'm sticking it in soapy water to keep it soaking. And it's not palm olive, but next best thing, right? And then we want to clean all the surfaces, even the ones that they don't stand on, that they ideally should never be coming into contact with. And take your time. It's a little bit tricky getting inside that, blo that uh, locking nut, little space in there. Now, of course, this is a little tricky to do, cleaning these up when it's 40 below outside. So what you can do is take the longleaf astroturf out of the block perches, take them inside, soak them in nice hot soapy water for 15 minutes, dry them up really, really well, and then put them back out on the block perches. Now, if the weather's that cold, your feathered ones aren't outside anyway. But if you are gonna put them outside so that they can eat, at least, and get, you know, 20 minutes of fresh air, they're standing on nice, clean perching surfaces. It's the next best thing to the whole thing being clean. Now, everything gets clean, everything. Give it a really good scrub. You notice I've got this upside down and soaking in the soapy water. I'm even gonna clean the spike that sticks in the ground. Okay, and you can see just how well made these are. They're beautifully made. Beautifully made. I'm gonna have to change my water again already. All right. Now, your longleaf astroturf has had a few minutes to soak. Let's gently open it up. scrub between the rows because you get dried blood down there you get poop down there they're bouncing around they're getting down on the ground they're getting back up on their perch you want to get all of that out of there so you just go row by row feathers coming out and there's grass coming out and then just roll it the opposite direction and clean the rows again you can see there's bits and pieces coming out of there it's been a little while since they've had a really good clean And again, especially the perches we get from Westwheel, they come with this longleaf astroturf mat. But once they get worn out, just go to your local hardware store. You'll be able to find longleaf astroturf mats or even buy the sheet. 
and then you can just use this as a template cut the exact same size again and fit it right back in there and that's ready to go all right now let's do a bath pan So this is shampoo, rinse, repeat, guys. You can do it any which way you feel like. You can do perch bath pan, perch bath pan, all bath pans, all perches, whatever turns you on. So, lots and lots of soapy water. backside. Now if you have dogs, as I have dogs, you'll know why you should be doing the outside of this. And I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so I'm going to leave that in there, let the sunshine just stand there and enjoy all that soapiness and drying it in and killing off any little bugs. And then I'm just going to move on to do Pfeiffer's Perch and his bath pan. All right, so before I weigh the feathered ones, I'd like to fill up their bath pans. It's a nice enough day, a warm enough day, that if they're in the mood for one, I'd like them to have the opportunity. Now a couple of things about filling up the bath pan. First, it should be level. Secondly, we want to fill the water right up to the point where it's almost ready to overflow. Now why is that? Well, as is the case with many things, Friedrich II was very specific in his book. He says the depth of her water shall be to the height of her ovaries. In other words, right to the top of her legs. And The reason we want the bath water to be that deep is so that when she gets down she can get her head right underneath the water, get the water up over her back and her shoulders, bring the water up into the equivalent of her armpits, really get herself submerged and cleaned and feeling good, the way that we all like to enjoy a nice bath and a nice shower. So the same thing applies to them. So we'll fill up Mojave's bath pan, we'll get everybody out, get them weighed, and see where they're sitting for the day, and that gives me an idea of how much I should feed them. I am trying to balance a couple of things with Halo and Mojave particularly. I'm helping them to have enough nutrition to support their molt because they're all in the early stages of the molt. Likewise, I'm also interested in keeping Halo and Mojave in particular moving. I want to get them flying again. We had that cold weather sort of queered the deal for us. So I want to get back to that as much as we possibly can over the next couple months, even as they're doing their molt. So that will let us know where we're at for weights and uh, we'll get to watch and see them splash around a little bit again today. Un, two, three. So now we're going to weigh the feathered ones. Chiraco and Halo have been hooded overnight, and part of the reason for that is me working to really preserve their feather condition. We don't want a repeat of the last year. You remember what those pictures look like. So he can't see me coming. So in the way that Friedrich encourages us to do in his book, as he does in so many other ways, he encourages us to call out to them. We can whistle, we can sing a little song, we can sing song their name, just to let them know that we're approaching them. All right, And we can hear Mojave calling out to me. He'll be able to see me, of course, because we don't hood our red tails here. So why don't we just crack on and get them weighed and see where their weights are at. Hello! Hello, hello! All right, he's looking in my direction. 
Now a couple of things guys, when you're working with a double door system, you notice I've got a door on my breezeways, individual doors on my Muse. When you're doing this, particularly as a novice, as a person who's just being sponsored and mentored, get in the habit of closing the breezeway door behind you. It's good practice to build your Muse with a double door system from the get-go. It's, it's a safety mechanism almost everybody is grateful for at least once in the time that they are working with and interacting with birds of prey. Get a double door system. So close this behind you. Now I'm going to leave it open with a heightened sense of awareness that it is left open and I'll be taking extra care to make sure I've got a good grip on the safety position that everybody's secure before I'm even coming out of the muse. But get in the habit to sing a song to your yourself in your head Close the breezeway door, dude. Okay. Or do debt. Hi, Mo. Hi. Hi. Hello. Yes, I see you. I'm coming. Just a minute. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, partner. Ready? Good job. All right, before I've even untied him from the perch, he goes into the safety position. I'm taking a look at his mutes. And this is something you need to get in the habit of doing. Look at their mutes. Do you see anything bright green, key lime pie green, frothy? Not a good sign. Do you see any bloody mutes? Again, not a good sign. Now in this case, Halo's mutes are perfect. They're shades of dark brown and with discreet, distinct white um, calcified bone. So all of that is in there. Um, it, nothing is standing out to me at all. Now I have noticed he has brought up his casting. Now when you're first handling your, your feathered companion when you've got your very first one, get in the habit of looking at it. Is it slimy? Does it have a weird coating on it? Does it have a bad smell? This doesn't smell of anything at all. All right. Bad smell, slimy, greasy looking, um, anything weird. Maybe it looks like it has little pieces of meat in it still. Anything like that. This is the sort of thing that you're looking for and paying attention to. Because when that sort of stuff sur starts to show up, we're dealing with crop issues. We're dealing with digestive issues. We may be dealing with other things as well. Now, occasionally you'll, you'll see one that, that comes out a little bit weird. You pay attention to it. You see, sort of say to yourself, okay, the next two, three, four, five days, I'm going to see if that happens again. If it doesn't happen again, you've made a note of it in your logbook, but fortunately it seems to have been a passing thing. If you're seeing this, bet, like a, a casting coming up looking bad, several days, a week in a row, it's getting progressively worse. It's time to put a call into our veterinarian, say, okay, I'm not sure what's going on. I've collected a few of these to bring down with me. Um, he's not quite himself or she's not quite herself because I'm seeing weird stuff in the castings. So this is the kind of thing that you're paying attention to particularly. As you go on and on and you get some more experience under your belt, you're going to find that you look at it and you register a lot of information just from a glance, okay? And like I say, this doesn't smell of anything, it's not slimy, there's no bits of meat in there, nothing that I should be concerned about, okay? So, a couple of things. I've got a brand new logbook that was just started today. Now, what should we have at the front of our logbook? Every time we've got a brand new one, or if it's our very first one, you want to put the ring number, or ring numbers, if you have more than one feathered companion you're working with, right on the very first page. So, why do I want the ring numbers right at the front of my logbook? If you're anything like what we have to deal with here in British Columbia and many other provinces in Canada, then you probably have to give some form of report at least once a year to your Fish and Wildlife Department. 
you know, the disposition, how many birds you have in your position, possession, this kind of thing. So if you've got it right at the front of your logbook, you don't have to go digging it all up or looking at ring numbers and trying to figure out what's on there. You've got it recorded already. It's conveniently all together in one spot. So that's a good habit to get into. Okay, so. Now here in Canada and in the UK, we typically weigh in grams. In the US and other places, they weigh in ounces. Most of these digital scales, you can set them for either one. All right. Now once again, he can't see where I want him to step or go. I have to help him. And among the other things that I'm thinking about is I'm looking after his tail feathers. So you remember from our dark, dark box video, I'm going to be sliding my free hand underneath his tail feathers as I ask him to step back onto the scale. Okay, you ready? Ready? Ready, partner? And step. That's a good lad. So we want our falcon's tail to be hanging off of the table, the side of the freezer, whatever surface we've got our scale on. We don't want him leaning against their tail because that changes their weight. Likewise, you notice I've got the Jesses held up off the scale, but I'm not doing this with them. Because if I do this, it changes his weight. If I let that relax, you can see we go back to his actual weight, which today is 940 grams. All right, so once again, step, sweetheart, good job. Okay, and now I can pop him down. Once again, when we are tying off to the perch, make sure that you're stable. That's right. That's, you're absolutely right. When he's right, he's right. Make sure that you're stable. You can put a knee down. I'm preferring not to do that because the grass is a little bit wet and mucky today. But I'm nice and stable. I know I've got him in the safety position. A little bit of pressure toward myself with the back of my hand closest to the ground. So scissors, pointing away from myself, pinch, drop Bugs Bunny into his rabbit hole, feed him a carrot, and then a half hitch. Okay. Step. That's a good last Step, step. Good job. What have you gotten done with your foot there? <laughs> okay. Now, ready? Ready, Halo? And there he is. All right. So now it's Mojave's turn. He can see me. He's been hearing me talking to Halo and to you guys, which is always fun. He's letting me know he's ready to come on out. I'm still going to address him. Mo, I'm coming. Just hang tough. I'll be right there. Okay. He knows I'm coming in. Brian's going to sort of hang out here a little bit because Mo can be a bit stroppy with him, a bit grouchy, owly. Don't tell him I said Owly. So the same process happens again. I'm going to fold up his big green mat after I sort of give everything a cursory look-see to see what's there. Bring that out with him, tied off to my glove, of course. Okay, well, it's your turn. Let's do that. Hi, Chiraco. I'll be there in a second. Mower! 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 Mower kitchen! Once again, he has a casting. It looks perfectly normal. Nothing to write home about. I know, I know. I miss the hockey games too. So perfectly normal casting. Nothing to write home about at all. It's just compressed feathers and spit. No scent, nothing. Nothing there that says there's a problem going on. All right. 
with Mojave not being hooded, what I just basically let him do is I turn the scale on and he hops down. Now he tends to be a little bit intimidated <laughs> when Brian's around. He's going to be wary and thinking Brian wants to grab me, which of course Brian doesn't want to do. <laughs> which of course Brian doesn't want to do. But we'll, we'll see how this goes. So he'll probably be sort of stamping his feet and performing a little bit for us on the scale. We'll see. Ready? Now again, I don't want to be pulling on the Jesses in any way. I want them to sort of hang gently loose in front of his feet. Okay, fantastic. And his weight is definitely up today. Pop him down. Where are you going, partner? There you go. Wait for it. Wait for it. See what, look what you got him down there, son. Well, you gotta wait. Now sometimes when Mo gets into this kind of mood, in his interest to either get at the dogs or get at Brian, because I'm closer he'll sometimes try to bluff charge me a little bit. Now what it comes down to is the fact that I've handled red tails a lot over these years. Mojave doesn't have any context for understanding that, but what he'll find is, it's, is that emotionally, psychologically, there's nothing on offer. I'm not going to reinforce those feelings. If he does sort of show me some attitude when he gets on the perch, my whole psyche will be saying to him, okay, and I know you're going to get to your point any second now. The moment a red tail thinks they've got your number, you're going to have a long, slow, uphill climb getting over that internal sort of space with yourself. So if you can think of yourself as an unplugged toaster, that you can go flippity 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 all day long and you're never going to toast a, a, a slice of bread as long as you live. If you can be in that space, I'm an unplugged toaster, they're never going to get on top of you psychologically. Okay, off you go. Now we can see he's mantling a little bit. He's looking a bit like a tough guy, but basically he's staying in his space. And he really wants to get into his bath. So we'll let him do that. Partner. All right, last but not least, our good friend Chiraco. Hey, partner. All right, you ready? And step. Once again, perfectly normal looking mute, not, or casting nothing to, to write home about. His mutes are normal. They're a lighter shade of brown. Nothing, no bloody mutes, no bright green frothy mutes. Nothing that we should be concerned about. There's no sort of off-putting smell that's above and, and sort of exceeds the, the normal smell that we often encounter in, in mews. Uh, one of the beautiful benefits of these green mats is I can really keep that down for these guys because I'm taking their mess right out of the mews. Okay. You gotta see this. Mo looks so cute when he's bathing. I think that's the equivalent of singing in the shower. Right. So the scale has been switched on. 
Scirocco is a little funny about me slipping my free hand underneath his tail. Typically he takes that as a signal to step down. It's always a good habit to do it with your falcon, even if he or she is doing that. Okay, you ready partner? Ready, ready, step. All right, okay, lift, 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 lift. All right, there we go. And lift, 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 lift. There we go. All right, and turn some, let's get on the scale. All right, once again, just letting the Jesses sit quietly in front of them. Chiraco's tail is hanging off the table. He's not leaning on it. And he's just a little shy of 900 grams today. Okay, he's probably a little bit lighter now. <laughs> on the scale, son. On the scale. On the scale. That's it. Yep. That was four grams. When we're thinking about what kinds of things to put into the logbook, we're putting in their weight, obviously. Did we see a casting? So I'll often write casting seen or casting noted. You can just put casting or a C if you know what that means. So their weight, casting, their mute. Were they normal? Did it look like your feathered one is having some diarrhea problems? Um, were they greasy? This is the kind of mutes you see when they've had a meal of beef, which these guys are going to be having for lunch today. I expect that their mutes are going to look a little greasy, a little bit smeared tomorrow. Make those kinds of notes. And then anything else in the, in, in the course of the day. Did they have a bath when one was offered to them? Uh, were they preening in the sunshine? Did they seem interested in what's going on around them? How were they when they were out for their flying or their manning? Did they seem to pay attention to anything in particular? You're making notes about everything because you're looking for patterns. Seasonal patterns, um, week to week patterns. You're looking for things that sort of stand out from the background normal of your feathered one. That's what goes in your logbook. Don't be afraid to use more than one page. Okay, so we're going to pop this guy down. See if he jumps in the bath. He often does. And then I'm going to crack on and take care of these green mats. So once again, get yourself set. You're stable. Got him in the safety position. Now I can untie. Leash goes through the key. Back of my hand is facing toward the ground. All right. And then I'm going to use my imaginary scissors, reach over with my thumb, point away from myself with my thumb. I'm going to continue to do that, which puts a little bit of pressure on the leash in the key. And then I'm going to run the rabbit behind the tree, pinch, I'm going to help Bugs Bunny get down into his rabbit hole, feed him a carrot, half hitch. All right. Ready, son? And step, 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 step. And he really doesn't like me lifting his tail. It's just funny that way. Okay, you ready, Scirocco? Ready, ready? Hey guys, so these are our amazing, beautiful, I love these green mats. Uh, this is one of the best ideas I've ever come across. Thank you Andy and your team at the Hawk Conservancy Trust in Andover for getting me hooked on this. One of the best ideas I've ever seen. So our pressure washer, it's just a little bit cold yet to be bringing it out and, and using that. Otherwise I'd be hitting these with really good dose of, of soap and water. Uh, in about two weeks time when I can trust the weather a little bit more I'll be definitely doing that. For now I'm just giving them a really good rinse like I do most days. In a couple of weeks I'll hit them up with the soapy water and I'll be doing that at least twice a week and the rest of the week I'm rinsing it strictly with the tap water from the hose. Um, this is just going to take me a minute. I'll finish these up and then we'll crack on with the steps for deep cleaning the mews walk you through all of that and uh, I'm looking forward to your feedback on that you guys so um, just give me two minutes I'll be all, I'm almost done
Okay, well, Chiraco's decided he's gonna have a bath, so that's probably a good place for us to stop. Next week, we'll pick up with the rest of the list of things that we're doing as our deep spring clean morning routine of a falconer. If you have any questions or comments, you know what to do down below. Let's start those conversations. I'd be interested to hear how you guys handle your spring cleaning routine and what your sort of daily routine sounds and looks like. Please, if you liked what you saw today, let's have a like, we'd love that. If you haven't joined our community yet, hey, jump on board. We're having some amazing conversations here and it would be lovely to meet you, have you join in on all the great, great information that's being swapped and exchanged. It's just marvelous. Remember also to hit that notification bell. I want everybody to have a shot at the giveaway that's going to be coming up. No hints. I just can't wait to see your guys' reaction. It's going to, I, I'm so excited. I've been working on this for a while. So we'll leave it there, guys. Thanks again for spending part of your Monday with us. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Thanks again from Brian the Feather and myself. Cheers. <laughs>